Good morning. I'm Terrell Sorensen, the Power County Extension Educator in, out of Power County, located in American Falls. What I want to do this morning is we're going to talk a little bit about our water outlook for 2022. And we'll jump right in and get going. You know, I had a friend of mine last night, I was talking to him. He says, uh, I told him I was concerned about getting this presentation today. And he says, ah, he says, don't worry. He says, the next day they won't remember anything about it anyway. And he says, and in your case, it's probably about 10 minutes after they get done with it. So, you know, no worry, just go ahead and do it. But, so I, I decided there's one thing I want you to remember from this presentation today is water is our most valuable resource. That's the one thing I want to make sure and get. Seems like this year it kind of brought it out more across this country, probably in the world this past year. Water is our most valuable resource that we do have. The rest of these guys, they talk about the, all their crops and their corn and their alfalfa and everything, but we still know what the most valuable one is. Anyway, let's jump right into it this year. This was a really busy year for water. We right the first part of the year, we had Congressman Simpson, he come in and he wanted to unveil his salmon plan. We just got the new year underway and he came out and says, you know, they're coming out with this big infrastructure bill. I want to jump in on it. He says, I think I can see a way that we can save the salmon. So anyway, his idea was he's going to put $33.5 billion in the infrastructure bill. He's going to mitigate to remove the dams, the four sn lower snake dams. He's going to put a moratorium on the lawsuits up there and and other, no other dams could be taken out in the meantime. And I thought this picture kind of kind of seen what was going on. He's kind of looking both ways to see if somebody's going to shoot at him. Or I thought this was a pretty good picture. But anyway, let's talk a little bit about the four lower Snake River dams. You can see, I think people don't realize when we talk about them exactly where they are. One of the things we want to do is talk about them and kind of locate them, give you a little history about them. This is Snake River Basin again. You can see it kind of winds down through Idaho. It cut, encompasses the six states, just a little bit in some, but it's the big drainage for almost all of the entire uh, state of Idaho. It's the 10th largest North American river. But you can see the one thing that uh, Oops. The one thing that uh, the Four Snake Dams, you look right up in the upper part there from Kennewick, Pasco, or to Lewiston is where these four dams are located. And we'll talk about them a little more here. This is some pictures of these dams. We're gonna kind of go through them a little bit. They look, these are the aerial views, kind of looking up river at them. They look fairly small right here. I don't think you realize how huge these dams are because you look over there and you think, gee, I don't know if I get a canoe going through some of these, you know, these locks. These are really big structures. The thing about it is these hydro power units, there's six of them in Little Goose Dam here. Each one of them's 135 megawatts. You got a total of 810 megawatts here. The interesting part of this right here is you look at the collector systems they have for the salmon smolts on both ends of it. They try really hard. We spent a ton of money up there trying to, you know, provide for the smolts to get up and down. And they actually think they get probably around 95% uh, survival rate on the smolts coming down through. They've done a great job of doing that, but somehow they, we still need to do better. Another one is the Lower Granite Dam. Began construction in 1965, completed in 1984. It's about 3,200 feet long. It's got six power units. They're each about 135 megawatts, about 810. When they constructed these, they wanted the smaller hydro units. The one thing that's really good about that is that they can use these for a lot of peaking power. 
you know, in the whole grid system. This is the one thing that's really great about them. You can raise or lower it really easy with these units. You can also see this one, they have the same things. They got done a lot of work, you know, with the collector systems. You can see the locks over there. Like I say, from this angle, it looks like you can't get much of a boat through there, but these are really pretty large locks that they have. Ice Harbor Dam is the third one we'll talk about. Completed in 1976. It's about 2,822 feet long, 100 feet high. You know, it's got, uh, it's a little different. It's got three units that are even 90 megawatts, and it's got three units of about 111 megawatts. So they vary them a little bit, so you get a lot more uh, variable with them. You can see this is a, another large structure. And the fourth one of them is the Lower Monumental Dam. Again, construction in 1969, completed in 1981. It's also got six units at about 135 megawatts, about the 810 megawatts total. These are really nice structures they got put in, and you think about it, they're really not that old when you consider dams. Like this one's completed in 1981. They're not really old dams. But these are the ones they keep talking about that they want to take out. These are the ones. So I thought maybe it'd be good if we just take a little pictures of them. Sometimes you're talking about these things. You don't really realize what's out there, and what these are. These would be fun ones to go view. And another thing we had this year, we'll talk about Lonesome Larry. He was the original salmon that came back. He was the lone one, I think, in 1992. This past year, we had 43 salmon that returned to Redfish Lake. Caught a few more down lower in the lower dams and put some in there, about another 200 salmon with him. But this is the sockeye that they did. 2020, we had 119, but it was a really tough year this past year on the salmon. Another thing we, along with this, this just happened here the end of October. The Biden administration, you know, they'd come up with a settlement, the plan that they had, uh, President Trump had put together, they'd worked on for a couple of years. They called it the 2020 Trump Salmon Plan. Anyway, they put the pause button on that. And what they're doing is they say they're gonna create a new one, a new lawful long-term strategy. This was done in October, uh, late October. Then also in October 2021, 20, they said the dam operation be put in to benefit the salmon. They're gonna route the water over the spillway rather than through the turbines. They're gonna increase the river flow, which I don't know if means you know, how much water we're going to have this coming year, but it's going to put a lot more strain on it. This is one I just put in just to show the upper snake uh, slide. When you talk about uh, water up in the upper snake, this is kind of the whole basin up there. You can see we have a lot of different watersheds up there that all come down into the one main, the eastern snake plain. One thing I want to talk about here is, uh, this is last spring. You know, one of the things uh, we've had, this is one of the driest years on record, but we've also had a lot of other dry years that are close to this. But one of the things that really caught us was this was kind of by surprise. You look at the statewide precipitation, we weren't really bad going into the winter and we had a fairly decent snowpack but you can see through March through June, we just got almost no rain in the state. Total-wise, it was uh, 2021 was the second driest on record. 1924 was probably the driest year we've had through the state. When you look at the, the period from 1924 to 1934, that 10 year period was a super dry period that we had. So hopefully we're not into that kind of a scenario. But you can see 2021 was a super dry year. Along with being dry, 
2021 in the Upper Snake Basin. We also had the hottest June on record. We uh, also, we were the fourth driest in the Upper Snake. You can see 24 was still uh, the driest precipitation wide, 1919, 1910, and 2021. So it was a super dry year, especially in the springtime. We headed into it, and then the heat hit in June. It was a really tough crop year. So what we want to do is we want to talk about, you know, we talk about the water outlook for this coming year. This is what everybody's interested in. The way we always, I always did it anyway, was I took the total water that we want. We got to have our carryover. And we see what our base flows, spring flows are doing, the river flows. Spring flows is what helps fill the American Falls Reservoir. Then we'll see what the yield of the watershed is. So let's look at the carryover that we got. I think most of you probably realize that, you know, we ended the year at almost a zero this year. You can see we've kind of gone down on the Boise, the YE, the Upper Snake Payette. You know, 2019 was about three and a half million and we just kind of slowly crept down from it. This last year on December, this is December 1st, so we've had a little bit of refill since then. So we're back to basically about just under one and a half million acre feet on the total system in our reservoir system. You can see the average is 2.8. We're a little over 1.3 million acre feet short of being on average. And we're almost one and a half million less than we were a year ago. We were thinking a year ago that we were in pretty good shape to carry us through, which fortunately it did. We had some people that were short, but in general we did make the year. So then we want to talk about our base flows. <clears throat> you know, we had, uh, when I talk about base flows, I mean our spring flows, the river flows. Right now we're still below average for this time of year. You know, we had a very dry July 2020 to July 2021 period. Just super dry period right in there. So we, last fall right now we were going into the winter with very dry soils super dry soils actually. So we had very dry soils going into the winter period 2020 and I don't think we took into account that they were going to be you know affect our runoff as much as they did. We had a heavy amount of groundwater pumping from prior year both 2020 and 2021. And also we had a dry summer and a wet fall in 2021. And this year, two months ago, we just had a very wet October, one of the wettest Octobers on record, which kind of set us up that we're going into, you know, the winter with some fairly wet soils on some of our watersheds, which is a super great thing if we get a little frost with it, so that set up that we get more runoff coming in. Okay, we talk about the yield of our watershed. That's another thing that, that's the big question mark. We got our pre precipitation, our rain, snow events coming, hopefully. That's kind of what we're looking for on our snowpack. A big thing too we found out from last year is the temperature when our runoff comes off. You know, we want it to warm up and come off quick. We'll get more runoff that way or else we want a rain on snow event. The other thing we got is our soil conditions. You know, right now we're looking pretty good on most of them, way better than we did last fall at this time. We got a lot wetter soil than we did. The other things that's not quite as big but still affects our yield is our noxious weeds. This is more during the summer time. And our vegetation, how much, uh, how many trees, how much is our forest up on the watershed. Another thing too is our aquifer levels, especially on our spring flows. You know, what is our aquifer doing? We pump pretty hard on the aquifer. What are our spring flows gonna do? Then if you look right on the bottom there, it's kind of what 
our needed snowpack, I think most people, when you look at everything we're talking about, we probably need right around 120% on, on our snowpack to get, you know, fill our reservoirs again. It's going to be quite a push to get there. One of the things we found out from last year, I think if you look on the Colorado watershed, they had one watershed above Lake Powell. They had a 90% snowpack, and I think they ended up with 26% runoff on it. You know, they had really limited uh, runoff on that period. So we need to watch that pretty close, but where we got the wetter soils, we're, you know, we're hoping we can get, you know, better runoff off our snowpack. You know, we're looking these uh, back there on our uh, drought monitors. You notice this is back in the end of July, this one. We were almost, almost gone totally brown across much of the western United States. Been a really tough summer. In June, July was super dry. Here's one that's about two months later. You can see we're starting. We got a few rains there in the middle of August. You can see down in Arizona, they started improving quite a bit. The monsoonals come in, and they kind of pushed up through the middle part of Utah, Idaho. So we got some better moisture in there. And here's one of the latest ones here at the end of November. You notice uh, we're in a little better shape there. Idaho doesn't have quite as much. The in fact, the southern half, we improved quite a little bit on it, but we're still, you know, still considered severe drought. Here's an interesting one. You know, last year the state of Utah was probably in one of the most severe droughts in the, in the nation. And you look at this, this is the Great Salt Lake. You can see 1986, they had probably their, their record highs. See how full it was. And the average is about 42.02. And right now we're sitting at the record low in 41.91, what their elevation is on it which is probably just about half of what the Great Salt Lake was at that time, back in 86. Just thought it was an interesting slide to look at. Here's a couple of slides that we got. We're coming out of the California with this. This is the San Gabriel Reservoir. You see it's just kind of a little river running through the middle of it. Super dry. Here's another reservoir, just got a picture of it coming out of California again. You see we just got a little bit of water sitting in the very bottom of it. Super dry in California. I want to talk a little bit about the California mega drought they're calling it. You know California is the biggest state in the nation for agriculture production. So you know if it affects them and sooner or later it's going to start affecting us pretty good. They've already come out with their projections for this next year. And they've already come out and the California director said the farm irrigation districts belong to the state water project. They've got a zero allocation to start 2022. Going to take a lot of rain, a lot of snow to get that back off of zero. They're just so low on the reservoirs. Said they delivered last year about 5% allocation. In a wet year, they deliver about 4.2 million acre feet. They're projecting they're going to have 340,000 acre feet that they're just going to put in for the critical health and safety needs of the urban areas. Last year in the Central Valley Project, they received zero allocation in 2021. Most likely they're going to get a zero again for 2022. And there's the, this last bullet point we got here is talking about our Lake Powell runoff. How we, they just got 26% of average and they had a median snowpack of about 90% on that. So you see the Colorado is, you know, hurt, really suffering. I think if you, you can read about that for days on end what they're trying to do with that. This is, you know, we, this time that we have here, I don't, the way I worked at it, I don't think we had time to cover the Colorado too. We're just 
trying to hit some of the other spots. You know, the one thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is the California dairy industry. You know, dairy's big here in Idaho. It's our biggest uh, ag industry here in the state of Idaho. California is the number one state in milk production in the nation. The top farm industry by revenue in California. And it, California totally is the biggest ag state. Tulare County is America's largest dairy county. They turned on, they got a zero allocation. They turned off their wells, I mean their uh, surface water. They had zero in most of the county for that. What they did is to keep some of their ground going, they turned on their deep wells when their surface water got cut. And they were able to get some crops that way. They, the booming industry in Tulare County and most of the ag valleys down there is the well drillers. The, they said most of the wells at the end of the summer though are running about half capacity at of what they were at the first part of the year. Super dry year in California, really pulling hard on the aquifers. The one large dairy I was reading about said they wanted to punch five new wells drilling them 700 feet deep to try to get more water. It's really starting to affect the, the industry there. A lot of them had just to fallow their land. The one thing that's really doing to them on their dairy industry there is they're getting higher labor costs. You know what's going on with the labor in the country around. They're getting a lot more higher feed costs. You know, the last few months with the Grain prices have been doing, their feed costs have been going up. So what some of them are doing now is turning to higher value crops. Instead of growing alfalfa, they're turning the water that they got available. They're putting it into the almond crops, more of your high valuable vegetable crops. Another thing they're not liking in California is they got a lot of rules and regulations they got to, to jump through. So you got quite a few now that's selling out and moving. A lot of them are moving into the uh, South Dakota, Texas, Colorado. A lot of your Midwest states getting closer to the, to the large uh, grain producing states, your corn producing states. So there's several moving out, but I think you can still say there's still going to be a lot of dairy going on in California. Somehow they can, they're making it work. But it's, the bottom line is you're probably going to see dairy going up. Another thing I want to talk a little bit about is that, you know, one thing I've been reading quite a little about is some of the impacts on the U.S. Uh, supply chain. You know, China's having some problems, some of its economy trying to, with its water. You know, Beijing's about 21 million now. They got some groundwater depletion. They say parts of it are sinking about a little over five inches a year now. You know, parts of the Central Valley in California, San Joaquin, those have been sinking also. I think they've gone down several feet. But you know, when you get into water shortages, it's showing up in some of the electrical power generation problems. They're saying their hydro and coal producers are struggling with some of the water access. They had a drier summer in parts of China. It says some of their, when they have a power outage, they're clamping down on some of their industrial energy consumption. That's the one area that they've been changing a little bit, and the end result is some disruption in some of their manufacturing. I don't know f how f much has been doing it, but maybe it's a bigger thing than we think. Maybe it's contributing some to the shortages there is around the world with some of the products be an interesting one to keep an eye on to see what's going on with it. I know they've got several projects they're trying to do to ship water into some of these areas, building new big projects. Another kind of switching gears a little bit. We want to go with the irrigated acres. You know, Idaho is a huge irrigation state. You can see that we uh, Increased were about 64 million irrigated acres in 2015. We're going up a little bit in that. 
Here's another one we, you know, we talk about quite a bit. We're the third largest in the irrigation in the nation. We, we use a lot of water to irrigate the crops. We're in a desert state out here. It takes a lot of water to keep our crops growing. Here's the one thing that we talk about. You know, our water levels peaked in 1985, and we've kind of gone down from there. I think our technology's been getting a lot better. We're getting a lot better we, our, with our pivots. You know, we're not doing as much surface irrigation as we used to do. We're getting better that we're monitoring just exactly what the crops are needing and putting that on. So our withdrawals have been going down during the last, since 1985, in the last 30, 40 years. But one thing that this slide right here that shows we got the crop production has been decoupled from water. The crops have increased about 26%. You see at the same time our irrigation has been going down. What we're saying is we're getting more tonnage, using less water. I think you can attribute that to a lot of things that uh, we're getting better, you know, better seed products. Technology is getting better. The irrigation is getting more efficient, and we're just getting uh, better farmers. And that we're getting some drip irrigation going in. You know, things have been changing there quite rapidly. Another thing that's been changing too is that originally, when I was back in the irrigation business. You can see in about 1985, they're projecting that the yellow line here was projecting that Boise would be, you know, clear up in this stratosphere here with their water usage. But this is the Suez, the DCM M and I water use has actually been very constant. Hasn't gone up that much, if any. In fact, it's actually down a little bit from 1985. And that's what we're projecting is that originally they thought they was going to have to go out and acquire a great deal of more water, but through a lot of things like water savings, doing different things, uh, they have actually not gone up in the water use. Here's one that kind of shows what the yield's doing on our sugar beet crops. This kind of goes along with the improved technology we're getting with the different crops. You can see back in 1982-85, we were right around 23 ton. Quite regularly, our average is better than 41 ton per acre. Plus, our sugars are going up on these crops. A lot of change coming with it. See, our potato has just been a gradual thing from 1964. We're up 425 in 2019. I think 2020 was much better yields. We're probably closer to the 450, 460, but we're probably down a little bit this year. They're talking about with the heat this summer, dry, hot summer. Another thing that we talked about is uh, the main trend was a decline in our water use, driven by a combination of factors. Overall use of water for irrigation declined about 8.3% from 95 to 2010. You know, people are, people are being more conservative with their water. We're getting better at what we do. Another thing too in the industry, we, we used to base it on that we'd just say that the uh, amount of water associated with production and supply chain, we used crop water use models. But right now we're getting much better results. We're going in and actually monitoring and seeing what they actually are using. You get different trends and conclusions that we're not using as much as some of the old crop water use models. We're getting, you know, different results with it. And the one thing that, uh, you know, in closing here, I think you got to think snow and rain for this coming year. It could be another really tough year, but one thing I've found with the irrigators if you get prepared for it, they do a lot of things. They're thinking right now. I know I've talked with several irrigators now. They're trying to plan on what crops uh, they might be changing to. They might change to a few 
other crops, maybe put some barley in where there's putting other crops in, you know, things that they can do to help save water. So I guess the main thing is you just think snow and rain. And hopefully what I found during the early 90s, the early 2000s is, you know, if we're prepared for it, we can get through these tight years pretty well. But what we need to do is see if we can, we can need a wetter spring and a cooler summer. So think rain and snow. That's, that'd be the end.